All right. Three, two, one. Welcome everyone to the Corporate Services Committee meeting held January, or March 29th, 2022. Uh, the attendees are myself, uh, Gladys Blackmore, Mayor Clayton, and John Laners is not here today. Uh, we have uh, zero delegations attending today, and we have three reports, starting off with the first one, which is 3.1, the Director's Services Area Report, Ms. Kinza Trim. Thank you, Chair O'Toole. Um, so in the corporate services uh, service area are finance, procurement, human resources, IT, and strategic initiatives. Uh, teams continue to work collaboratively on the ERP implementation. The focus at the moment is on design decisions, data gathering, conversion, and migration within four of the modules. Uh, in assessment and taxation, the tax scale, sale rather that was um, previously scheduled for March 18th is now being canceled as the arrangements were made by all properties that were eligible. Taxation is going to be starting to prepare for tax time as well and moving back to our June 30th deadline. In our finance, uh, February month end has been completed and our finance team will report back to senior administration within the next two weeks on that. Committee will also receive an update on the 2022 variance for Q1 following the March month end close. Our draft 2021 audited financial statements are expected by the end of the week. Uh, presentation will come to committee by our CFO as well as our auditors uh, and at April 12th committee meeting, um, along with the Q4 unaudited city financial report. The preliminary budget planning with departments has commenced as well and business planning is progressing on track and the development of PBB requirements based on council strategic plan is also on track. Procurement uh, continue to facilitate competitive bids and we currently have 16 bids open which can be accessed via the city's website under bidding opportunities. In IT and GIS, the distributed collaboration has been expanded to include Aquaterra data sets as part of the regional data sharing partnership Capital construction projects, story maps, and dashboards are being prepared for the construction season start. And they, um, GIS is also working on the mobile data collection applications that are being reintroduced for our summer program field work um, for apps that we use for tree stump removal and weed inspections as examples. And uh, last but not least, the citizen experience team have processed uh, 5,618 calls for service to date in the month of March. Um, of note is approximately 45% of those relate to our recreation services. Uh, a clear demonstration that the, of the spike in demand for our recreation facilities uh, from the community. And that concludes my report uh, for this meeting. Well, thank you very much. Your department has been very busy. Was there any questions for, okay, we'll move on. You get off the heat tonight or today. Uh, item 3.2 is the successes and opportunities within the Citizen Contact Center. Uh, Mr. Doug McGuire is gonna do this report. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair O'Toole. Um, we're, um, we're gonna draw them, yep. There we go. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thanks, Chair O'Toole, the committee members, uh, Mayor Clayton and councillors uh, for allowing us to give this presentation in support of the report requested by the committee. Um, just a bit of history. Uh, in 2014, the city established the Citizen Contact Centre to help citizens navigate the myriad of department answered phone numbers, uh, providing basic responses to inquiries, providing enforcement service dispatch support and redirecting over 70% uh, of the calls uh, to the departments. In 2019, as part of the city's uh, citizen experience strategy, the Citizen Contact Center began working with operational and service departments to optimize the citizen experience through the standardization of processes and the building out of a knowledge base to support quicker resolution of service requests. In 2020, administration in initiated an RFP for a case management software solution to organize the citizen request for service. And in spring 2021, the city introduced Access GP with 311 and commenced the implementation of a customer relationship management system that supports the integration of processes, corporate knowledge, and citizen interaction. 
Today, Access GP, the current iteration of the Citizen Contact Center, has grown into a digital engagement center. In 2022, uh, it is estimated that almost 60,000 omni-channel interactions will be addressed. By comparison, in 2019, that number was 33,000. The city offers multiple points of access for the citizen, including via the phone using 311, web submissions using our Access GP portal, text message, email, and social media. Um, we wanted to highlight some of the operational improvements. Access GP strives to use technology to provide better service, both to the citizen and to the operational departments, and use the most cost-effective resources to deliver that service. As the implementation of the strategy has evolved, we have realized benefits along the way. After implementing 311 and the digital knowledge base, we were able to realize a 21% reduction in call times benefiting both the citizen and city resources. With the implementation of the CRM, we have leveraged those quicker call times, web intakes, and service categorization to create a further 38% reduction in re required resources. Additionally, with the quality of information provided by the departments and the ability to monitor and trend issues, we've been able to reduce uh, subject matter expert demands by 60%. The entire uh, customer service strategy, including 311 and the CRM, are focused on improving the customer experience. When someone reaches out to the city, they are looking to address a quality of life issue. They shouldn't feel like they need to go searching. A single web location, social media platform, or merely dialing three simple digits should begin the service process. Whenever possible, Access GP aims to resolve concerns at the initial point of contact. However, if required, the citizen's journey to a subject matter expert should be seamless, and with a subject matter expert providing a response in a consistent and meaningful fashion. The customer experience does not end with that call. Their feedback drives innovation and continuous improvement and that they should expect the same or better experience the next time they call. We're also able to do some statistical analysis that wasn't previously available to us. This includes service requests by type. The current intake avenues note the largest volume of service requests continue to flow through our phone system via 311 at 79.5%. The remaining service requests are split across our, face, our sorry, Access GP non-emergency portal, email, Facebook, and in person. Prior to the implementation of Access GP web portal, the city utilized C-Click Fix. C-Click Fix handled less than 700 concerns per year, compared with a first year expectation exceeding 3,000 cases on the Access GP portal. Uh, we want to be monitoring those indicator statistics, those things that help us understand our, our citizen and our, our business uh, the best. And so some of the things we monitor are things like case volumes. Average monthly volumes range between 4,000 and 6,000 requests for service, with variations influenced primarily by environmental factors and program changes. We want to man monitor number of interactions by service type. Every interaction is assigned a service type, and those are monitored for trends and to ensure we adapt communications to reflect demands for service where appropriate. Uh, average wait times. Our target is to intake and process all calls within five minutes. However, spikes in volume can at times affect this. Our average wait and processing time for calls over the last four months has been five minutes and 12 seconds. To support reduction in wait times for citizens, administration has recently added a callback option that allows citizens to receive a callback without losing their place in queue. Uh, we, resolution time. Resolution times vary depending on the type of service request. However, for non-urgent transportation cases, those are typically addressed within 24 hours and most within the eight hour shift. Factors outside of our control, significant swings in weather as an example, have the ability to impact those response times. As well, complaints regarding lack of resolution. Additional calls on the same request are followed up with the department to ensure resolution. The number of transactions that would be deemed unresolved by the citizen is not currently tracked, but is the planned future data collection enhancement. Appeals to escalate the matter are handled both within the contact, uh, citizen experience team and forward to the department as appropriate. Escalation of matters related to council interest, policy, or bylaws are directed to the appropriate contact for mayor and or council and or the online delegation forms. 
Topic trends. Our citizen and experience team monitors request, uh, types of requests regularly and work with our communications team to communicate with the community on areas where we see the highest spikes in volumes. Other things that we want to look forward to monitoring are things like rerouting time. Our citizen experience staff within the contact center manage and maintain knowledge articles to help ensure uh, they have the appropriate knowledge to respond to most requests that do not require action by another department. The public version of these knowledge articles is also available on our Access GP portal. As we always seek to optimize the utilization of staffing resources, this approach ensures that subject matter experts within departments are not interrupted regularly to respond to requests that can be addressed by more junior staff and SMEs can continue, can continue to remain focused on their areas of expertise. Uh, the other issue is disconnects. Disconnects can occur for a number of reasons. It's an industry standard to have an abandoned call rate between 8 and 10 percent. We are consistently less than 10 percent with occasional spikes during weather events or announcements related to the pandemic where volumes temporarily surge. Uh, continuous improvement. So we have some future improvements that are, are in the pipeline right now. Um, one of them is customer service satisfaction surveys. Survey, uh, we've, been, we've been trialing this now for a few months and understand that survey al surveys allow us to understand citizen satisfaction through the process. Uh, measuring the satisfaction on their initial customer service experience and then again on the resolution uh, so that we can gauge satisfaction with the operational response. This will allow us to identify and follow up if there are issues that require further attention. Uh, implementation with additional departments. We are in the second year of a three-year uh, implementation. And so we're looking forward to adding additional departments as we move to a one-stream, multi-channel model of intake. We continue to add departments with the most volume and citizen value. Uh, access GP logins. As well, we're in the soft launch phase of Access GP login, so where a citizen can use their Apple, Google, Facebook, or email and password to create a secure and simple way to track their cases, applications, or inquiries. Just going to provide a, a simple demo. This is using a, a mobile device to show what it looks like to, ac to <laughs> access Access GP. And so I will um, narrate this for you. So first thing is asking questions via text message. Um, you can see because we're on a telephone, you get all of the options, call, web, chat, uh, message, or Facebook. So this gives the citizen the ability to engage in their preferred channel. Um, we're gonna look at uh, text message, which is a really good way to answer a simple question for a citizen. Uh, it is our agents live on the other end, and it really does serve well for simply a question like what's, how long is Eastlink open, uh, various questions that are just yes or no are very simple, um, we can engage in a very personal, friendly, kind of normal way that a citizen would like, would be interacting even with their, within their social group. One of the things too is as we are, when, after all of these are concluded, we are still tracking the data so we know that what was asked for was Eastlink hours and we can be thinking about how do we present that information so it's in front of the customer so they didn't even have to call in next time. We're always looking for those kind of improvements as well. The next one is versus uh, via Sam, our chatbot. He was down there on the bottom. He's flying. He's working quick this morning. Um, so clicking on Sam, we get this opportunity to type in a question, sort of in the normal language that you would ask a question. I have a diseased tree. Uh, Sam goes through our uh, knowledge base and then pulls up, hey, I've got a couple of things to deal with infested and diseased trees. You press uh, the report you get an opportunity to type in an address. One efficiency that's gained here is because it's in an address base, you know, we're, there's less errors. We're able to actually track it. You can actually drag that point. So if the tree was in your backyard or side yard, you can actually move the point of the tree. And then you can further describe it and that will help op operations understand your request. As well, you can upload a photo or a file or a document in support of your request if that's what's necessary. And then once that's uh, processed, confirming my contact information, because my email's on there, I'm going to, I get my support, I get a case number, and then I'm just gonna flip over to my Gmail account and presto bingo, I have a new case logged and I have a, a case log history. 
um, available. And then uh, we also have lots of opportunities for the citizen to find those engagement pieces on our website, through online services, through Contact Us. Um, this is on our main city webpage. Um, you can see we have our physical addresses, our mailing addresses, our phone numbers, email, online portals. Uh, it gives our hours um, description a little bit in the middle there to help you know, um, make those choices, again, flesh them out so people understand what's available for them. As well, you can see online services in the middle of the page. Um, web services has done a good job to make sure we're visible. And so they're able to hit uh, those. Or we can scroll down to the bottom of the page and they've been putting trending article, uh, trending issues as a direct link. And so in this age, we've got some storm drain, some report a pothole or report flooding. And so if they click on report flooding, it pulls them straight into the portal, right into the, the beginning of a report at the uh, knowledge base. And it does talk about, in the knowledge articles, it does give a framework to the citizens so they understand uh, how that's being, um, how that's managed. And so they understand our operations a little bit better. Um, at the conclusion, because I provided my, my um, email address, I would get an email that came back. And the blue is being filled in by our operational departments. So you can see it's sort of in the middle there. So the below service request has now been closed. And in the middle is the comments that were made by our parks department. Our parks arborist has assessed your concern. And it has been determined that the little green worms are a natural occurrence and are ultimately beneficial to the tree and the environment. And so we're able to close the loop with the citizen and they know that their, their, their matter has been addressed. And that is my presentation, if there's any questions. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I didn't welcome you to council, so I apologize for that. Uh, I have one question. Uh, I know there's lots of information there, and uh, I'm kind of overwhelmed at uh, all the stuff that we can do now. Uh, do we have an idea when most of the calls take place or the uh, concerns come to our attention? Um, we are, so the Citizen Contact Center is uh, 8.30 to 4.30, Monday to Friday. Um, we do have initial spikes in volume at the beginning of the day, just before uh, the lunch hour, and then again, just as kids are coming off of school. Um, but we're, um, it is a, it's a pretty steady stream. Um, emails are interesting because they are a lot of requests that come in overnight. And so we, we have a backlog come morning uh, of email requests and the weekends as well. We, we wind up with a backlog when we get in on a Monday morning. Fair enough. I'll open it up to uh, Councillor Bosch and then Councillor Thiessen and Councillor Berg. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair O'Toole. Uh, that was a great presentation. Thank you. My question is, because I'm a fan of texting or that little bot, but um, can the number that is that came in our package here for, you know, the 0425. Can we put that into our contacts and will it directly take us or do I have to go to Access GP? Uh, no, through the chair, you can directly uh, uh, call that uh, text number just as one of your contacts. So when I would text, and I didn't because I don't want to make up something fake, but um, do you just get an uh, automatic response that we've received your text message, or is it within that 5.12 minutes uh, you would receive an actual response? Uh, through the chair, those um, uh, messages are handled by our live team. So during operating hours, we answer them directly right away. Okay. Um, also, uh, and maybe this is some part of, the, of this, I talked to Director Trim about this. It's like, uh, when someone has a concern and is, you know, the choose your story, storybooks, you know, will, will it direct you in a path um, predominantly on the most frequent questions, for instance? Uh, so it, um, through the chair, if we're talking about the chatbot, if you go in through that web access, uh, the AI is determined to pick up trends to your language, the sentiment that's going on in the city at a particular time. So it is, it does help to navigate you to the most common questions that would be being asked on that subject or those keywords. Um, I'm hoping I'm catching that properly. Nope, that's good. 
And I guess um, additionally, and I don't know how we're going to do this in the future, but um, I would like to see uh, some of these services in after 4.30 and on weekends because people don't stop living in the city at, at 4.30. So um, thank you for your presentation. I got next in queue is uh, Councillor Blackmore. She's been waiting for probably eight minutes, so I'm going to give you the, the benefit of the doubt to go next. Thank you. Well, thank you, Councillor O'Toole. I almost said Councillor O'Connor. Sorry. So my, first of all, I think that uh, this is a great change in how the city is communicating. This, the process has been developed over the last two years. And I think that people will respond to it well. I just have two, oh, one question and one concern. My question is, if I'm phoning uh, on the weekend because my street is flooding, who's going to answer that call? Or how will that response be met with? Um, there, there has to be some kind of weekend service, and maybe I just missed it in the report. Uh, through the chair. So we do have messaging on the phone system that directs them to the emergency numbers and uh, for uh, transportation service after hours, there is a number that is managed 24 hours a day uh, for emergency services. Um, and also we give them the contact information for emergency enforcement services after hours. So those are presented as an option uh, when someone phones in. Um, my comment is, um I noticed that a lot of the language you use is uh, a language that in itself builds barriers and is not direct language. Uh, for example, uh, experienced staff. Test, uh, I, I feel that uh, it's something that the team needs to be aware of, that you're using language that in itself builds barriers by making labels. Uh, and really all your, your, your whole process is to uh, solve people's problems. You know, if I'm calling because I have a pothole on my street, I'm not calling for a massage or a, or body sugary. Um, so I feel that the language you're using uh, needs to be uh, reevaluated and made more direct. Uh, one of the things that you talked about was the SME, which is a something management expert. Answer that. Yeah. Yeah. The subject matter expert is someone within a department that has the expertise to deal with or answer the question. So we would put it through to the person with the best skill set to respond to the citizen's request. Um, as far as experience, and, oh, sorry. So do you understand what I'm saying? How the language you use builds barriers in itself, and you need to be aware of that. The call a spade a spade and be more direct will provide a better customer experience to use your words in the end. And that's just a comment, mm -hmm. something to think about for the future and something that I'll probably remind you of in, um, in a while, in a few weeks. Um, I just have spent a lot of time working with uh, customer relations tools and I know that the language you use that you think is all encompassing is in fact a barrier and call a spade a spade and, be, and move on. That's all I have to say, Councillor O'Toole, so you can move on to the next person. Thank you very much, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, Chair O'Toole, and uh, welcome to uh, to this area of the city, Mr. McGuire. appreciate your report and uh, look forward to future ones. Um, now. Uh, I love I love that this is titled successes and opportunities because inside opportunities I think sometimes there's things that we can do better and there's things that we can fix. Um, over the last month and a half, I've received several phone calls on a variety of topics from uh, snow removal to where transit stops are being placed to the hot water at the East Link Center. Um, and there was a common theme amongst all the citizens that, that contacted me. and. And that was that they contacted the, the contact center and they did everything that they were supposed to do. 
just in the end, they never got a return email reply or whatever, and they were sort of left hanging in the lurch for a while until they called back to the city at the contact center, at which point they were told that that file was closed and the work had already been done. Uh, and in some cases, it, it hadn't. Um, so I guess my question for you is, how can we better address this uh, and work out these bugs and uh, follow up to officially close the case by having a conversation with our citizens? Through the chair. Um, there are, one of the reasons we're doing the logins, uh, offering that login feature is one of that, it's gonna give a very live my cases, what's happening in all my cases. It's gonna report, it's gonna relay the information that's going on in the department. It's in work order, it's pending. When the comment closes that case, they're gonna get a, not only an, an email notification at the end, but they're also gonna be able to go in and see their own history of how things have been dealt. Um, if they, we, we, we ask for an email every time because every case that's closed with an email on it gets a, an email. We don't, we have, we've just, that, that's a feature we've enabled and, and said everybody gets an email. So if we get an email, um, as long as that's a valid email address, they will get a case closed. It's um, a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, for those who, who don't want to provide an email or I guess maybe don't have an email, um, and, and in a lot of our calls, 79.5% of that volume are coming in via phone, um, to do a one-to-one -one back would, would be uh, requiring a lot of resources uh, just to be able to now return folk. We're, we run it close to 100%. Um, there's a lot of volume, especially when through uh, winter activities and stuff like that. Um, and so to then start to plan to do return phone calls, it becomes, that's a, that's a average phone call time coming inbound is about five. Our average outbound phone call, and we do, do have, there are those more complex issues where we will do outbound phone calls, but they're now up in the 12 minute range. And so it does, it's a pretty significant burden. Um, so we're all about wanting to close with the customer. And that's why we, when they phone in, we really do ask for an email um, because that's the way we, and just that example I showed, we put the comment right from the department on the email for them so that they can see that. No, oh, thank you for that. So um, does the system have anything built into it where if somebody doesn't have an email or doesn't provide an email for whatever reason, that uh, that it automatically marks it? And then, then you know, I, I would imagine that not everybody, everyone's going to leave an email or 95% of our callers will leave an email uh, for the ones that don't. Is there a way that the system can mark it so that we have that follow-up and that return engagement with our with our customers and our citizens? Uh, through the chair, sorry. Um, yes, there. Um, um, it could be a future enhancement. We don't actually sort it that way now. One of the unique features of the system is, um, 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 in the technology realm, what it is is the only unique identifier we have for a person is an email, um, because. Uh, phone numbers can be shared. They can be a home phone number shared. We've got more people in, with the same name in town. We've got uh, even people inside the same address who are, you know, there's more to, than one person to a house. So um, from the technology perspective, almost, I don't know of a provider who doesn't have something other than email as the unique identifier for an individual in these days. And that's why it's such a key piece. Um, so that's why that's the, the model that we've been using. Um, the s second piece to that is um, we c um, I'm thinking about solutions and trying to think about how would we sort that out and what would the resource demand be to be able to figure. But I think um, that's an enhancement we can definitely look at. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Uh, again, uh, opportunities, right? So uh, we want to be able to engage the public as as crisply and cleanly as possible and make sure that they know that their things are closed. And if there is an opportunity to just, within the system itself, just, oh, no email, okay, return phone call, then at least we're aware of it. And then that way, our residents who do call in and don't provide that email to us for us to get back to them and show them their file, that they have the opportunity to know that their their work has been looked after and, and then they have more confidence in us and the organization all together. But no, thank you very much for that. And uh, I look forward to how these opportunities unfold for us. Councillor Berg and Councillor Brassi. Thank you, Chair O'Toole. So Mr. McGuire, I actually gave uh, your system a test run last week and it passed. So just share my experience. I noticed a deteriorating, si a deteriorating sidewalk. I actually had a customer explain that uh, you know they had a high heel issue in this little pothole on the sidewalk and 
So I went out to take a look, and, and the sidewalk, just due to all the salt over years, has really deteriorated this year. So I took some pictures, went to the website, very easy to use, uploaded the pictures, did the address. Uh, it came back. One of the things I couldn't find was reporting sidewalks, but uh, I just put it under potholes, and it came back uh, that within hours that it's changed from potholes and paving to sidewalk concerns. And the next day I got another um, email from you and it said uh, the transportation team has put the program list or on the program list for this summer's repair. So um, quite happy with how it worked. It was quite intuitive to, to navigate. So I just wanted to say props to you guys. Thank you. Thank Councillor Bressy. Go ahead. And then Councillor Blackmore. Great. Thank you. Yeah, just my experience as an elected official is when I first got elected, it used to be uh, resident has a concern it's uh, call this number and you have to memorize this number or send this really specific email and then once I got over that barrier 50% of the, I always tell them call them see if staff can help you if you don't get a satisfactory response then circle back to me and I'm happy to follow up and probably about 30 to 40 percent of the time the resident would call me back and say we didn't get a good response at all and now it's just call 311 or just info at city com. so way easier for them to access it and I very, very rarely get a resident calling me back saying that wasn't a satisfactory response. And usually when they are, it's because council set a policy and they're not happy about the council policy. So staff can't help them <laughs> if they're disappointed in us anyways. So just, I know firsthand, there always are opportunities for improvement and I, I want us to always be making this better, but holy smokes as an elected official in the last four years, have you folks made my job easier and our residents' lives better. So thank you for that. Uh, my question is, and with us talking FOIP later, maybe this isn't something we can do, but have we ever looked at or have we used Pixel or other those analytic, other analytical tools to see when people are calling us or emailing us or especially messaging us online if they visited our website before and not found what they want or if their first point of contact is coming to us? Just Is that data we've been able to collect yet? Uh, through the chair, thank you for that question. The, the um, we work with the web team, uh, so Sean Tucker and his team to look at um, wh what's being accessed in what order, and are they getting satisfactory answers. Uh, the analytics on the uh, chatbot are always telling us you need to add some. Uh, customer wasn't satisfied; they went to an agent, or they went out and tried to find another route. And so we're able to we're able to look at those questions and say, hey, what would the right answers have been, or what would have made this much easier to navigate? Um, so we are using tools between the two of us, and we're just in the process of trying to figure out, okay, now how do we bring these tools together so that we're getting a clearer picture? But uh, that is part of the strategy. Well, and something I'd be curious about is using Facebook Pixels, one tool, or some of those other tools that I know I use in my business. I'm curious if there's ever been or something that it might be worth working for is seeing not just how our customers accessing, uh, accessing, um, talk to our chat bot and where are they getting through our chat bot and through the access GP initiatives. But if they're calling to ask for Eastlink center, have, can we see, have they visited the Eastlink center website? Have they done that Google search before or have they sought it out on social media? Or I just think there's some analytical tools. And again, maybe they're problematic with privacy, but I'm, I'd be curious to know if residents are coming to 311 info at GP first because they're getting frustrated by not finding what we need on our website. Or, or sorry, I'd be curious if they're not finding what they need on our website and then showing up at Access GP is a problem to is probably a problem in our website design. Whereas if they're just calling us first, great, that's fine. Our website hasn't failed them. I guess is what I'm saying there. Uh, yeah, through the chair, we we are um, so we, we actually sort of took the keys on August eighth last year, and so our database is just becoming richer to the point where now we have enough customer information that we would be able to to start do some of those higher function analytics. So um, those are great uh, suggestions, and I can take it back to our team to see what what's available to us. Great, awesome, and again, so much improvement in the last four years. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. All right. Last one in the queue is Councillor Blackmore. Go ahead. Thank you, Councillor O'Toole. Uh, my, uh, just in response to the question that Chris asked about people getting follow-ups, uh, follow then maybe they don't uh, leave a, uh, an email account or maybe they phoned in. Uh, can we not provide them with a unique number ourselves? Like here's your reference number uh, when you, you know, give us a day to work on this, you can call back in and see what the solution is or 
where we're at with your problem. Uh, can we not provide that uh, distinct number ourselves as a way of closing the loop in communication? Uh, through the chair, uh, yes, uh, we do provide that case number to them. Sometimes they don't understand what the value of that case number is. We try to educate everybody as they come through. And if they have that number, they can actually, uh, no. I was just going to say they can look it up themselves, but you need to attach it to, even if you're anonymous, you still need to attach it to a the unique identifier because we want to protect people's information because we do get requests in relationship to enforcement. We get, and it's one system. And so being able to make sure that we can um, uniquely identify a person um, and because you could literally troll case numbers if you were just kind of, you wanted to. Um, doesn't sound like fun, but you could, I guess. Um, but then you would have access to addresses and where things have happened or where service requests were made. And that probably is something we don't want to, to make easily available. So um, it's kind of that catch-22 where we want to make sure we have uh, ease of access for the citizen, but we also want to be able to protect their information. And so having that unique identifier is kind of that piece. But if they have that number and they phone us back in or even text us that number and say, uh, because we do give that case number at the end, at the conclusion of every call, here's your case number, write it down. Um, um, and I can, you know, uh, I will go back to the team too and make sure that in our processes is it clear enough that there is access with that number. Um, but they could text us back uh, or they could phone us back and we would be able to give them an update. Um, all right. Okay. Well, thank That's you. Good. Yeah. So I think that needs to be stressed a little bit. Uh, Councillor O'Toole, are you ready for a motion? I am ready for a motion. And you're the one that's going to make I it. Move, I would move the committee accept this report for information. Thank you very much. I guess we need to have a vote. So it's just you and me. Thank you very much. That passes unanimously <laughs> to nothing. With that, thank you very much, Mr. McGuire, for your report. It's much appreciated. And I think this is the first time you've presented the council. It is. But I thank guarantee you. it probably won't be the last. <laughs> thank you. All right. We'll move on to 3.3 uh, FOIP policies 501, 502, 503, and 504. Ms. Valerie Norris Kirk. Take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As they say, we always save the best for last, so hang on. I'm going to present some exciting material to you folks. Um, the first one is administration is going to recommend that committee have council support and approve the following policies. So the first one is uh, policy 501, which is the personal information bank. The second one is policy 502, which is safeguarding um, privacy. Number three is policy 503, which is the authentication of identification. And the fourth one being policy 504, which is the oral and or electronic consent. Uh, the city of Grand Prairie maintains privacy that's based on four key values, which is the respect of individual privacy expectations, building and preserving the trust, mitigating privacy harms, and compliance with the spirit of privacy and data protection as it relates to the FOIP Act. So policy 501, under section 87.1 of the FOIP regulations, uh, as a public body, we are mandated to develop an information bank. Essentially, that information bank is a list of um, personal information that you might collect what department that information is housed under, where do we get the authority to collect it, and under what pieces of legislation do we have the right to collect that personal information. So we've been working very hard with the departments over the last year. We've got a few more to do to complete that personal information bank. Once that's completed, you will see that posted on the city's webpage. So if the general public ever wants to call in and do a FOIP request or wants to know where their personal information is being housed, we can rely on that personal informa information bank to pull up that information for them. Any questions on that one before I move ahead? Yes. Councillor Blackmore, do you have any questions regarding the report? I do not. Okay. Uh, with that, do you want to 
deal with business? Sorry, Mr. Chair. I'm just, I just wanted to know if there's any questions on the first policy. Okay, sorry. No, no worries. Thank you. Um, the next one is policy 502, which is the safeguarding of privacy. So this is a general overall encompassing policy that is basically the City of Grand Prairie's commitment to ensuring that we are going to, as we move forward, and very much like um, Doug's presentation, when we're talking about introducing new innovations into the organization, that we're going to commit to having appropriate policies and procedures in place to protect that personal information. Any questions on policy 502? I see not. Okay, policy 503, authentication of identification. And I actually want to maybe perhaps talk about that one um, and the oral electronic consent policy 504 as well. So back when the pandemic hit, um, of course we had some key service areas that still needed to maintain a level of service when it came to providing programs and services, whether emergency or non, to the general public. Um, and so some of the challenges in that is when we could not meet in person, how do we identify somebody's uh, identification? Um, and whether or not we could um, collect oral or written consent whether it's uh, through an email or over the phone. So back in February 2006, um, there were some significant changes to the FOIP regulations that did just that. It recognized that, you know, we need to have another avenue available to municipalities when they're needing to provide these services to collect that information. We also have um, partnerships with other organizations within uh, Grand Prairie, so Northreach, for example, being one of them, the Wapiti Dorm, where um, whether it's an emergency situation or a situation where we need to confirm someone's identity and that person, for whatever reason, they're not available, um, that we have the ability to reach out to a third-party service provider who knows that client well to um, confirm their identity. So between these two policies, they essentially are allowing the city of Grand Prairie to do that. Any questions? Councillor Blackmore, do you have any questions? I do not have any questions. All right. I can make the motion though. Is there anyone else has questions before mm. I make the motion? Or no, just I hold on here. Are we ready for the motion? Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, you can go ahead and make the motion. I would move that committee recommend council approve the following policies as presented. Policy 501, personal information bank. Policy 502, safeguarding privacy. Policy 503, authentication of identification and policy uh, 504 oral and or electronic consent. And then speaking to the motion, um, it's not a very well known fact, but uh, electronic signatures have been legal since the invention of the telegraph. Oh, we're just building on that. I wouldn't know that I wasn't born then. <laughs> yes, well, Mike was. Hey, you're a long ways away. I know you can't hit me right now, so that's good. Okay, a call for the vote. And that carries unanimously. Move on to item uh, four, which is correspondence. We have none, no other business. Bylaw and policy review, I would think that we just did that. So uh, outstanding items list. And that is. Thank you, Chair O'Toole. So we have two items on the list. Uh, the first item, 1186, which was the update from the Citizen Contact Center, was presented today, so it can be removed. Uh, and the one item remaining will come forward on the April 12th uh, committee meeting. Great. Thank you very much. And Ms. Blackmore, would you like to make the motion deal with the outstanding items list? Um, I move committee received the March 29th, 2022 outstanding items list as amended for information. Motions in order. Call for the vote. Uh, 
passes unanimously. And with that, I want to thank everybody here for attending the uh, Corporate Services Committee and uh, the presenters. So thank you very much. That's a wrap. Goodbye.